So thanks. Great. Well, hello and uh, welcome everyone to today's Meaningful Movie event on criminal justice reform and dismantling systems of mass incarceration. Uh, I'm Jackie Ballinger and I'm a member of the Church and Society Social Justice Committee at First United Methodist Church in Seattle and we're the hosts for today's event. And I just want to start by saying uh, a huge thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, a special thank you to our panelists today for sharing their valuable time and expertise with us. Um, please note that we are recording today's session and it will be made available later on the church's YouTube channel. And we are going to uh, keep all participants muted here just to minimize disruptions and distractions for our, our speakers. Um, and we will ask folks to put their questions in the chat and we'll do Q&A that way. Uh, Emily and I will read out questions and pose those to our speakers. So please do use chat for your questions. Before providing an overview of our session, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot tribe, and the Snoqualmie tribe, both past and present. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and all native people. We hope everyone had an opportunity to view the film that provides the background for our panel discussion today, True Justice, Brian Stevenson's Fight for Equality, which highlights Stevenson's work with the Equal Justice Initiative and his efforts to address systemic racism in the US justice system. If you haven't had a chance to view, that's completely fine. We're happy to have everyone here just to hear and learn from our panelists. And as a registrant for the event, you'll continue to have access to the film via the link you were sent in a confirmation email. And just to note that we're grateful to the makers of the film at Coonhart Film Foundation for access to this work. Uh, just to offer a, a quick recap in case it, you watched the film a while ago or didn't get a chance to watch it. The film really provides a, a really powerful exploration of how the history of racial injustice and violence in this country has produced and continues to shape our current justice system and mass incarceration. The film's summary educational materials note that in the last half century, America has become the nation with the highest rate of incarceration in the world has authorized the execution of hundreds of condemned prisoners and remains the only country with no minimum age of trying children as adults in the criminal justice system. Punitive practices disproportionately target and impact communities of color where more than half of the people on death row in this country are people of color. The Equal Justice Initiative Project believes that our failure to honestly confront our history of racial and economic injustice means that we struggle to truly practice equal justice for all. And for more than three decades, Alabama public interest attorney, Brian Stevenson, who is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, has advocated on behalf of the incarcerated, seeking to eradicate racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. And the film really chronicles Brian Stevenson's struggle to create greater fairness in the system. And he challenges viewers to join him in creating a new and brighter future. In planning this event, we decided that we really wanted to focus on what's being done now to address the, some of the issues raised by the film, particularly at the, the local, county, and statewide level. We're in the midst of the state legislative session, and we wanted to be able to provide attendees with a sense of what's happening now in the space of justice reform, and also highlight some ways that we might be able to take action. So we won't be spe focusing specifically on a discussion of the film amongst participants today. Uh, and instead, we really want to give uh, plenty of space to our panelists to talk about their current efforts and provide opportunities for all of you to ask questions of our experts about their work in this field. Again, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and um, we'll leave time at the end for question and answer. And we will try to get through as many questions as we can. And with that, I wanna hand over to Emily Riggler who will introduce our panelists and moderate our discussion today. Over to you, Emily. All right, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up confirmation? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So um, hello everyone. 
Um, my name is M. Rigler. I am also a member of the um, Church and Society so Social Justice Committee, and I have the honor of introducing our panelists today. So I'm going to just go through and um, introduce everybody, and I think then I think we will let um, let each individual panelist speak for a few minutes about the work that they're currently doing. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started with that. Um, so first, uh, first off, we have Tierra Dearborn. She is King, Seattle King County Lead Program Director for the Public Defender Association in Seattle. Lead provides a community-based alternative to jail and prosecution for people who engage in crime related to unmet behavioral health needs and extreme poverty. She has focused her community work in youth services, post-prison education, re-entry, and recovery. She is passionate about criminal legal justice system reform and has dedicated her career to helping others with healing from the effects of intergenerational trauma, addiction, and incarceration. She's a member of the Klamath Tribes of Oregon and values advocating racial and social justice for historically excluded communities. She has been involved with civil survival, focusing on post-incarceration community re-entry and legislative change for communities impacted by the criminal legal system. She is co-chair on the Advisory Council for the Husky Post-Prison Pathways Project at UW-Tacoma. Tiara is a member and local community leader for the formerly incarcerated college graduates network. She has facilitated addiction recovery groups as a volunteer with Smart Recovery. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and minor in nonprofit studies from the University of Washington Tacoma in 2019. Welcome Tiara. And then we also have with us Anthony Blakenship. He is the senior community advisor in the policy and advocacy departments with civil survival. In his role at civil survival, Anthony helps to connect and empower people that have been impacted by the criminal legal system to build their collective and individual political power. After facing discrimination in both employment and housing due to his criminal record, he began finding ways to use his experience of incarceration as a strength. Since being released from prison, Anthony has been working to undo the harms created by the criminal legal system and hold systems accountable to those they serve. He helped start an, an entrepreneurial program at Monroe Prison, worked as a trauma-informed yoga trainer and fundraiser for Yoga Behind Bars, and most recently worked as a coalition organizer for the ACLU of Washington. He, Anthony holds a bachelor's in political science from the University of Washington, as well as a dual master's in social work and public administration from Arizona State University. Welcome, Anthony. And then we also have two um, individuals joining us from the Washington State Department of Commerce. Kurt Myers is a justice reform specialist who has worked in higher education and various nonprofits as a project coordinator, strategic planner, development assistant, and investment and partnership officer. He is passionate about personal, personal and societal transformation and possesses strong skills in relationship te and team building group facilitation, public speaking, event coordination, technical writing, and strategic planning. His professional focuses are business and nonprofit developments, vocational and post-secondary education, and career development and societal reentry for formerly incarcerated people. As I said, he currently works for the Washington State Department of Commerce. Welcome, Kurt. And then finally, we uh, joining us, we have Starsha Ag Agu. Her 10 years of local, state, and federal government experience in the legislative and public um, agency arenas reflect her genuine, deep-held interest in social justice work and effective advocacy for social justice-promoting causes. Some of this work started while she was still in undergraduate study at Washington State University and continued as she transitioned from college into the world of work, initially at the University of Washington and then the state of Washington. She has greatly enjoyed consulting with universities and colleges, with nonprofit organizations and pro bono programs in business. 
and with commercial enterprises, which are developing and implementing effective media, marketing, and lobbying strategies. Her work with the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and later the Soros Foundation, added importantly to her range of experience. This prior work has provided her with a rich network of contacts in a number of states and some agencies in Washington, D.C., with particularly broad-ranging experience in her own home state of Washington. Her decade of work in a number of settings has involved a good number of interorganizational networking and program building on both the creation creating creation and sustaining ends of networks formed for public interest collective action. Her experience includes working both behind the scenes in the staff work setting and engagement in open advocacy in legislative testimony and public media serving as the public voice of an organization or network. So wel welcome Starsha and thank you all of you for joining us. Um, so we, the way we envision this is we would give each of our speakers about seven to 10 minutes to sort of talk through their organ, um, their work and what, they, what, they, what they're doing. And then at the end of it, we will be taking questions from chat. Um, so I, um, Tiara, if you would like to kick us off and then we can just go down the line. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's good to see everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tara Dearbone. I currently work for the Public Defender Association in Seattle. Um, we work on a number of different initiatives related to criminal legal system reform and racial and social justice. We don't do public defense. Uh, we used to uh, long ago before the county took it over as a nonprofit. So that's where the name Public Defender Association comes from, but now we work on uh, a number of other initiatives. Uh, we'll soon be rebranded as Purpose Dignity Action, so we'll still be PDA. But um, <clears throat> my job um, at PDA is to oversee the operations of LEAD um, within Seattle and King County. And LEAD stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, as well as Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. LEAD started in Seattle um, in 2011. Um, at the time, there for, for it had been going on for quite some time at that point, but um, at the time there were a lot of efforts um, around uh, conducting um, research related to uh, racial disparities in policing for um, drug enforcement. So um, a group of public defenders brought forth litigation against the Seattle Police Department and the city for um, uh, drug enforcement inequities. And um, the research really demonstrated that most people who were engaging in selling drugs in that area during the time were white. And most people who were experiencing arrest and incarceration for drug related offenses were blacks. So the um, public defenders, uh, city and county prosecutors got together to discuss what could be done instead. And that's really where uh, the birth of the idea of LEAD started. Um, and now LEAD is practiced across the, the nation in about 80 different jurisdictions, as well as a few internationally. And what LEAD does is creates a framework of collaboration between community and system partners that's, um, that acknowledges the need to address um, unlawful behavior, but also acknowledges the harm that, the harm and inequities that exist in the legal system in order to do that. And so creates um, an avenue for community-based care for people who um, engage in low-level crime related to behavioral health needs, um, extreme poverty and substance use disorder. So uh, essentially at the point of arrest for certain offenses, somebody can be diverted by law enforcement to a social service provider who then um, conducts a, um, an intake with an individual and provides intensive long-term wraparound case management services. Those um, Services are intended to be harm reduction focused, client centered, and to work on people's individual goals. Um, and it really can address uh, lots of different needs. Many of people who are referred to LEAD experience extreme um, uh, trauma, and that could be intergenerational trauma, uh, poverty, violence, aging out of the foster care system, 
having incarcerated parents and um, um, or having experienced extreme violence or domestic violence situations. And so a lot of people who are referred to lead have really complex needs, may have been experiencing homelessness for um, a long time and receive uh, wraparound care in order to address those underlying needs. And that care uh, really could go on for many years. It, it depends really on the person's needs, engagement, um, and goals. So that is my uh, day job. I don't have a lot of time to go in depth about all of uh, everything that goes into LEAD, but you can, you can read some of the research um, that was conducted by the University of Washington um, over the first four years of LEAD being established at leadbureau.org. You can also um, read some uh, additional information about LEAD outcomes today on um, our website, which I'm happy to share in the chat. Um, I just want to add to that, in addition to this work, uh, I'm also involved along with Kurt Myers with the, um, and uh, Professor Dr. Christopher Beasley at the University of Washington in Tacoma, um, working on the Husky Post Prison Pathways Initiative. And our objective there is to really pilot um, a pathway from prison to higher education at the university and be able to share that um, pilot with other universities. And so people who have been incarcerated face lots of significant inequities. And um, one of those includes access to higher education. If we wanna talk about um, reducing recidivism, um, higher access to higher education and um, employment and um, a living wage is really one of those tools. And um, I'll just add, I come to that work really with lived experience. I am a person third generation impacted by the criminal legal system. Uh, my mother was, my grandfather was. And so um, people who also have parents that have been impacted by incarceration are more likely to experience incarceration. And that includes at very young ages. Um, really for me, part of my healing journey was access to higher education um, after incarceration. I was the first uh, first generation to um, access college, let alone graduate from college in my family. And it really was transformative for me. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of my um, friends in this network uh, would say the same. And um, so we are really focused on creating access to higher education for people who have experienced incarceration. And so um, that is that work is kind of getting off of the ground. We just now um, submitted a proviso and had a sponsor uh, within the uh, state legislative process to create the first bit of funding for that project. The University of Washington, even though we've been working on it for several years, but uh, just finally getting off the ground. Um, I will um, also add that I've been involved with formerly incarcerated college graduates network which is a national network of people who have experienced incarceration and who have a college degree. So um, accessing college after incarceration is not only difficult um, to do, but people who have experienced incarceration also face other barriers and significant barriers when in college. And so we really are a network of um, people who have had the college experience after incarceration or during incarceration who um, uh, network with each, each other, uh, share opportunities to advocate for access, um, and uh, just starting to create a collective movement in this country towards um, access to higher education. So that is a uh, just a little bit of what I'm involved in. I am happy to share some of the, oh, I see some folks shared some, some links in the chat. I wanna thank everyone for listening. Um, if you have any other additional questions or comments, I'm, I'm always happy to talk with people about this. I really appreciate um, people's willingness to try to bring light to some of the inequities that exist in the legal system and um, post-incarceration. I think Anthony will talk a little bit about civil survival, which I've been um, involved in uh, a little bit from the community point for a few, few years, but um, also in, um, 
um, addition to the inequities that exist in policing of, of people who experience poverty and um, behavioral health concerns and the inequities that exist in access for higher, to higher education, there are also um, many barriers for um, people post-incarceration that can be addressed to some degree through legislative change um, that, that create access um, to other things that people need to really recover, thrive, and um, uh, try to, to be individuals that are also contributing to the community with our uh, unique experiences. So thank you, I will end there. Thank you. Um, Anthony, whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, Anthony Blankenship, he can pronouns. I am with Civil Survival Project. I'll drop the link. Uh-oh, you're muted. Right after Civil Survival Project. We lost you, buddy. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Great. I still know how to use, I still know how to not use computers well. That's awesome. Uh, I'll get there one day. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Anthony, he, him, Civil Survival Project. I dropped a link to our organization in the chat. I've been working with the organization. Um, I've been employed by the organization for about uh, two months. I've been working in a volunteer capacity for a lot longer. The organization has been around since 2015. We provide a number of resources to people who've been impacted by the criminal legal system, as well as anybody who's um, interested in supporting people um, that have been impacted. Um, this is everything from legal assistance. Uh, what that can look like is like helping people vacate their records, uh, vacate their drug possession charges, um, which under the state versus Blake, you know, basically said that anything that or any drug possession charge is uh, was deemed unconstitutional. Um, so, you know, trying to help people get their drug possessions vacated, uh, which has caused so much harm to our communities and really, you know, our attempt to uh, take a look at this from uh, from a healing standpoint. And, um, and then, yeah, we provide legal financial obligation relief. Sometimes we'll put on LFO days at different, uh, in different counties where people can go down to the courthouse and get their uh, legal financial obligations taken a look at and get relief from, from it. it. Sometimes it comes at really high interest rates. And so people are just like in this debtor cycle when it comes to it. Um, helping people with like appealing denial for um, occupational licenses. Uh, I know our founder, uh, our co-founder Tara Simmons, when she was uh, like, her story is super powerful. You know, the 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 brief the the brief part of this is she went to prison, got out, became a lawyer, and uh, they tried to deny her the bar. She took it to you know she took it to court and won. Um, and so, you know, making sure that's, a, that's an important part of, you know, our work and of, of making sure that people uh, can find work afterwards, right, and can, and can follow their passions. And, you know, she uh, used that to elevate herself to become, you know, a legislator. So, um, you know, going, you know, she's the first person in the state, we think, or in the country, we think, that's been formally incarcerated and then became a uh, elected officials. So that's really awesome. And, you know, we really want to make a path uh, for that for other people. Um, and then lastly, you know, we try to, uh, like, help people get relief from um, being convicted of sex offenders. So after a certain time and certain crimes, you can get some relief from that and being taken off the list. And um, so on the legal assistance parts, that's what we do. Uh, that is not my focus. <laughs> So I am a community organizer and my, you know, my focus is on building community power um, of people who've been formerly incarcerated. There's about 2.2 million people in Washington that have criminal records. And when we think about that, like, uh, that is a lot, that's a lot of folks. It's not just people that have been behind bars, but people with criminal convictions. And what does that avenue say about, uh, about the 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 catch all of the system, right? If that if that if there's only eight million people in Washington, and that many, like we have some serious work to to do. Um, and so what we try to do is organize our people, make sure that the policies and the laws that 
um, are impacting them are not going to uh, create lasting, uh, you know, lasting harm. And as a system, you know, as a system itself can cause a lot of harm. And so what we're trying to do, and they show that in the video, right? Uh, um, I was able to watch some of it. I didn't watch all, I didn't watch all of, uh, all of it, but, you know, what they talked about was just the disproportionality of, um, of, of racism when it comes to uh, asserting a death penalty, you know, in the South. And that jump off right there, you know, we were able to um, um, overturn that so people, you know, don't get the death penalty in Washington State no more, um, in large part because of the work that advocates do, you know, and that, that strength together, we can stop, you know, we can stop harmful things from happening to people in our community. And 95% um, of the people, what we say is 95% of the people that are behind bars are going to get out. Um, what is our duty as a community to make sure that they get out and are healthy and can actually thrive? Um, you know, and, uh, and then part of that, right, is leadership development. We really want to develop leaders. We have Starsha, Tiara, and Kurt, all amazing leaders in our community, but we need to build more, right? There's 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 never enough there's never enough leadership um, when it comes to this work. So you know what we what we do is um, and what my like focus on right now is because it's legislative session. So we focus on trying to create policies that are developed by our community and that are or developed by an, another community. And what we want to be able to do is make sure that these laws are going to create healing, are going to help people. One of the things that they talked about in, in that was uh, the relationship of uh, incarceration to the 13th Amendment. And, um, you know, uh, I don't know if y'all watched the 13th, but, you know, what one of the things that they really hit on, right, is like this exception. There's an exception clause is anything or, you know, or slavery is ended except for, you know, people that are incarcerated, right? And the relationship between that and people in prison working for 42 cents uh, an hour or 55 cents a month cannot be overstated. So one of the things that we're trying to work on currently is getting people uh, more appropriate wages um, and also making sure that they're not forced into labor against their will. That's the big part of what we're really, you know, trying to focus on. We don't think we're going to be able to get minimum wage for people, but maybe we can get them to a point where they can um, have some sort of, la you know, something that's going to help them build um, a financial base for when they get out. And so, you know, getting some savings, also getting more money because it costs, what, $6 for some toothpaste behind bars? Uh, how in, you know, a dollar for Top Ramen, like how, you know, how can we, uh, how, how can we, that $55 a month, you know, can, you know, is, is really not a lot. So, you know, we're trying to up that. And I think our goal is to get, you know, $200 a month. But the other big part about that is closing the loophole of making sure that uh, the forced labor part. So currently, if you are, um, if you deny uh, a work um, position, then you can be punished. And that punishment can come with a major infraction. That fraction could take time off of your um, off of your good time and basically perpetuate and make you stay in prison longer. Um, you know, they really, you know, hit on you for trying to program and work is programming. And what we also call that is institutionalization, right? And so what we're, you know, really hoping to do is do our best to uh, take some of these some of these laws that we know are really harmful and un undo them. You know, we've been working and we've worked with uh, the faith community quite a bit on some of our bills. Uh, faith Action Network is an amazing partnership, our amazing partner of ours. Um, one of the things that we've been doing with them, and unfortunately it failed, but we tried to end long-term solitary confinement this last year. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the idea was the cost, you know, what the state said is, the co is, is too costly. And so when we're talking about, you know, how y'all can get involved and get engaged, it is leg letting your legislators know that some of these things um, that we're fighting for um, are not just uh, good policy, but in order to, in order to 
uh, have safe communities, we need this, right? You put somebody in a box the size of a, um, a parking space for decades and since youth, you know, we just, we just uh, got rid of youth solitary confinement. So when you put somebody in a, bo or a box the size of a parking space, and then do that for decades and then say, hey, go out and be somebody and go straight from that little box to your community. What does that do to someone, right? Um, so we're, you know, we're really focused on on, on bills like that. Um, and uh, we've been trying to make sure, I talked about Blake a little bit. So we're trying to make sure that all of those unconstitutional charges, they come with fees and fines and people have been paying those off, making sure that they get their money back, making sure that uh, people can get resentenced based on, um, based on, you know, not having that charge in their, um, uh, uh, in their record. Uh, all super important because we know, you know, get, you know, gun or drugs aren't just a gateway to, or marijuana is not a gateway to other hardcore drugs, right? Drugs are a gateway to prison. And so that's one thing that we're, you know, trying to, to make sure that we're closing that gap and making sure that people are whole. Um, and uh, and I'm running through these bills really, really fast, y'all. But <laughs> and I and I'm sorry. And I can I can drop uh, I can drop in the chat some of our like our more our our priorities. But uh, other things that you know we've been working on um, are making sure that crimes don't as a juvenile don't impact you when you become an adult. That's something that's uh, it, something that's really. Um, important to a lot of people and it should be important to all of us right like the dumb things you did as a kid should not follow you for the rest of your life right it should end and what is you know and then who is considered an adult um, is also another thing that we've been working on you know brain science says anybody up to 25 and sometimes older um uh should their brain is still developing. And so those people should still be under that, uh, should still be considered youth. What we're trying to do, I think, M, you have, or somebody may have stated, um, you know, there is no, there, there's no um, lower limit to the age range that you can try, you know, a juvenile. Um, in Washington, I think it's eight years old. We're trying to up that to 13 um, based on both brain science and, you know, charging an eight-year-old for, um, for serious felonies, like, well, you know, what is that, what is that, you know, how does that make us look as a, you know, as a first world society? I just, I don't, I don't get it. So, um, and then also making sure that that upper limit as well, which is really important to age 25. And so taking a look and saying anybody that's 25 and younger, is still considered youth and should be treated like that because their brain is still developing. They're still making mistakes based off of that. Um, you know, in when I think about civil survival, we're you know fighting fighting for the survival of uh, our our ability to be civically engaged. Um, one thing that you know we have won is getting people who've been formerly incarcerated. Um, the ability to vote as soon as they get out of, you know, prison. And with that passage, you know, it opened up the gateway for a lot of more people to get civically engaged, to want to be civically engaged. And we have to both let people know, but also understand the like historical background from that. And that comes, that comes down to um, way back when they called it the civil, you know, civil death, right? Or civic death. And um, so our name derives, you know, specifically from something like that, right? It's like we're we're fighting to be engaged, you know, uh, to be back in our communities and to make sure our voices are heard. Um, you know, we we're trying to advance policies because we we do feel like everybody, you know, should be able to have that right as you know, both Americans or people who are here on our soil to be able to. Um, either vote or be engaged somehow. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, I think my, as far as like the work in, um, I'm someone who's been directly impacted. I know, every, you know, Kurt Starcia, TRS too. And um, 
this this work uh, hits me deeply because of the different um, experiences I've had in life. You know, one thing that I think we all share is that we're not just people who have been um, charged and committed, you know, of crimes. We've all been survivors. And majority of people behind bars have been survivors of a crime. Um, they're also, they've also all experienced trauma. Go into prison itself, having handcuffs on you is traumatic, you know, and Tiara talked about, you know, that healing journey. It is so important when it comes down to it, how, how as a community can we um, engage folks and make sure that the path you know, is there for them to be able to succeed when they get out um, or not enter in the first place? Are there ways that we can make sure that we can heal people without taking large portions of their lives away? And this isn't just, this isn't a matter of um, making sure justice isn't done. It's just how do we, how do we do it, right? Um, and I know that they talked about that in the movie, which I, you know, really appreciate. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, this is a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to speak with y'all and I'll kick it over to my guy, Kurt, uh, who could talk next. Uh, just very briefly before Kurt goes, um, I am collecting the links um, and we will send them, we will send them out. And I'm also, I've also, I will find a explainer for those of y'all that are not as plugged into the criminal justice system who were not aware of State v. Blake um, as a former public defender. I, I was working when it was handed down. So I'll, I'll find a little more information about that as well. Um, Kurt, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. And um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, I've, I've been now, it's, it's just a pleasure to be here. First of all, thank you all for having me and all of us. Um, it's just, uh, I just sit back, like uh, listening to Tierra and Anthony speak. These are two, you know, colleagues that I've known for many years we've been working in this space together. We were once um, incarcerated, you know, um, maybe maybe not together, but around the same time, we came up in the same sort of era um, and suffered uh, many of the same challenges getting out. And um, so it's just really amazing to see us all here able to, you know, um, talk about the work that we're doing. Um, it's really uh, always inspiring and encouraging to have a community um, and I think that that's really what we're aiming to do is have a solid, um, you know, foundation for folks that are coming home um, and also, uh, you know, a, a good um, intervention strategy for the for the youth that are um, struggling now before they get um, pumped into the prison system. So um, it's really uh, it's just amazing to hear everybody um, and also uh, I could I could speak to some of the things that Tierra was mentioning. Um, but she 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 actually did a fantastic job of talking about FICGN, the formerly incarcerated college graduate network. We've been uh, sort of working to build out the Northwest chapter for many years here. Um, and I think that that's a good resource for anybody who is uh, formerly incarcerated and who is doing post-secondary uh, education is trying to further their education. Um, also, uh, the Husky Post-Prison Pathways program at, at UW-Tacoma, that's something uh, uh, Tierra and I have been working on, uh, you know, pr pretty steadily for the past three, three years or so, maybe four at this point. Um, and it's a, something that, uh, you know, education is really an important part of our uh, reentry, too. So it's, it's something that we want to make sure is available to everybody else so that they can overcome those same barriers. Um, so that is awesome. Uh, and then to Anthony, uh, his, his recent uh, employment at Silver, Civil Survival, uh, I'm so stoked for him. Uh, the organization's uh, definitely benefited from having his knowledge and wisdom uh, and his experience and, and all of that. I'm, I'm just uh, so happy to see uh, organizations utilizing our lived experience uh, so that, that we can um, best address these problems that we're facing. Um, so with that being said, I am uh, you know, uh, I was I was incarcerated from quite some time for quite some time. Uh, I was uh, I went to prison at age 17. So I was declined on as a youth. Um, and so uh, I was also impacted um, by my juvenile uh, 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 
points or the, or uh, my my criminal history uh, my sentence was lengthened because of that so there's there's a there's a bill um, being put forth this legislative session to do away with that um, because it just it kept me in there longer so um, uh, so yeah I spent um, from age 17 to 32 in prison um, and uh, I was lucky enough that while I was incarcerated uh, I had access to opportunities some folks didn't have. Um, my father was able to pay for my education. So I was taking correspondence courses uh, while I was in the cell every day, um, learning things that my, my fellow inmates didn't, couldn't, uh, you know, learn, didn't have access to. Um, and I started to see that the system really wasn't built to help people stop coming to prison. It was, in fact, set up in such a way that would uh, lead folks back to prison more readily. And so I thought that was something that um, we needed to do something to correct. And so and it was I just thought it was ironic that it was the Department of Corrections uh, was was was, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to correct the problem in such a way. So when I got out, uh, I, I, I went to UW Tacoma and I pretty much laid under the radar, you know, like I'm formerly incarcerated, like I don't want anybody to know this. I'm trying, I'm trying to get a job, you know, like I got, I got a, a future to think about and, um, and then uh, come to find out there was a whole lot of other people just like me, and everybody wanted to see the same uh, systemic uh, challenges uh, addressed and so um, I went and bounced around from nonprofit to nonprofit after I was incarcerated and then I finally uh, uh, found my, my last position my, my current home at the Washington State Department of Commerce and what we do there. Um, we have a reentry grant program, which I manage uh, $5 million over two years over the course of the past two years has been allocated. Um, this was, I believe, uh, put in place by Tara Simmons, who was a co-founder of uh, Civil Survival and is a representative Simmons, excuse me, let me uh, title her correctly. Um, and she, she initiated the program and for the last two years it's been going on. We're currently funding 15 organizations. My, my office is funding 15 organizations uh, across the state. Um, we, uh, at I think we, uh, I think it was like 18 counties out of the 37 counties that we have, right? So quite a, quite a bit of a spread across Washington state we're, we're covering. And um, there are various uh, different kinds of organizations that we fund through this grant program. Um, you know, some addressing different challenges, some might, you know, more, more so specialize in on the legal side of things, some might be more so specializing on um, uh, more re basic needs reentry uh, stuff for folks that are just getting out that need that that quick little um, support, uh, whether it be a backpack with some some underwear and socks <laughs> or um or or you know uh tools and uh you know access to technology you know so sort of laptops and things that they want to go to school and all that so there's um there's various organizations that we fund i have a link in the chat that uh leads to the commerce page there you'll find all kinds of other links to different resources that explain in greater detail what it is that uh that we're doing um, as it stands, we don't know for sure if this program is going to continue. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, reentry is not something that we, though, though Washington State is doing, doing well in a lot of areas as far as addressing this issue, um, there isn't a whole lot of reentry funds, you know, like funds going towards assisting reentry. There are other states that are allocating quite a, quite a bit of money to it. Um, and so we're hoping that this continues. We're hoping that there's more um, funds allocated uh, to, these, to these amazing organizations across the Washington state that are ran oftentimes by us, people who are directly impacted, people who know the problem uh, and, and know the solutions. Um, so, so yeah, so um, that's, that's generally it uh, as far as my current position. I'm really grateful to have landed this position. It wasn't necessarily something that I ever thought possible for myself. And I believe my fellow panelists can um, attest to uh, the same uh, with regard to our, you know, what we thought we were capable of and where, what we've been able to achieve. Right. And so I think that that's been in large part due to the fact that people are starting to realize that this is important. And I appreciate all the folks out there who, uh, who are who are advocates and allies alongside of us so that we can do the good work that we need to do to address this issue. 
All right. Fans, fantastic. Uh, Starship. Um, and just so that you know, we're hoping to leave about five or six minutes for questions. So if you could keep your remarks to about uh, seven ish minutes, that would be great. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Sure. No problem. It's such an honor to be here. Starsha you. I think I'm just going to do a little bit more storytelling than the other folks who are on here. Anthony, I'm so glad that you went into the legislative stuff. Pierre, I'm so glad you talked about lead. Kurt, I'm glad you talked about the reentry programs. Um, I spent from the time I was 15 till I was 21 incarcerated. Um, I had six, six class A felonies. I took a plea for three. And by the grace of very thankful, did not get tried as an adult. I did have a declination hearing. And so I'm very thankful for being able to be in a juvenile facility. But some of the things, having been a victim of rape, abuse, neglect, abandonment, um, and only one program, dialectal behavior therapy, a 15-week program made up of five different modules-ish. Um, I had so many different things that I needed before to be adequately prepared for coming into the community. And I'm also very thankful. I put a bunch of links in the chat, but I was I emailed the governor and Oprah, a bunch of people to talk about some of these issues, which is probably not a, it wasn't appropriate for the setting or the place, but I thought it was the right thing to do. And I knew from a very young age, like I, I'm built to do this work. So um, I'm so excited to be here today. And so some of the things inside, like the education, I went inside at the age of 15 and I had a third grade reading level and a fifth grade math level. So I think those of us who have been formally incarcerated and hopefully uh, at least the folks that I know in the community, we feel like we're always trying to play catch up. Like, we, can we ever really um, meet the standards or the expectations? Um, and so I, as soon as I got out, uh, I got, I spent 15 to 21, I got out in 2008. And then I went straight to, I got July of 2008. And then I went to WSU Go Cougs. Um, and I got my degree in criminal justice. And then I went straight to work with uh, Dr. Truppen with the Division of Public Behavior Health and Justice Policy. And um, why I was really excited about this work was because we got to do participatory research. So we got to talk to the actual people who have been impacted and put that into a form of a report and not just to put it on a shelf so it could be there, but to get it out to lots of folks. Um, I also am very excited to share, I was published in the Harvard Educational Review Journal. I guess I can put that in the chat, but talking about record sealing, like those of us who are on the panel today, we've been working on this work for a very, very long time. Um, and there's so many different aspects, record sealing, can you get a job? Do you check the box? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Now in Washington, they've made it, well, Across the country, really, they say, have you ever been convicted, adjudicated, delinquent, transported by, like, there's really no way to get out of saying no from marking the box. Have you been convicted of a felon, even as a juvenile? And for a long time in Washington state, we actually sold juvenile records, which is such a shame. Um, and we worked through that with some amazing folks, Teen Child, uh, Columbia Legal Services, ACLU, a bunch of folks. Um, and you talked about my bio earlier, uh, Emily. So I've, I've had six years of state experience. Honestly, I swear I would never go back to the state because it's a little bit, I hope it's okay in this setting, safe space to say like, it's a little bit soul sucking and really hard for those of us who have been directly impacted. Do they treat us different? It's in the air. I don't know. Depends on who you ask. Um, is it really hard to get those jobs? Certainly your resume should be phenomenal. And it took a village. I know it's kind of corny and cliche, but it really took a village of amazing, phenomenal humans who have invested in me to get to where I'm at today. So 15 to 21, got my degree in criminal justice, worked for UW, then I went and worked for the state um, with juvenile rehabilitation as an administrator, the first formerly incarcerated person to work for the administration who was once inside their facility. Super awkward. And I got my hopes up. There's this a little bit of 
for lack of a better word, I guess, dog and pony show or tokenism that happens with people. And I thought at one point I was okay with that, where it's mutually beneficial for our community and for, for those of us who are directly impacted, so it's okay. Um, but I'm sad to say over a decade later, um, these bills that Anthony, Tara, Kurt, like that we've talked about, and thank goodness for Tara being our first in Washington state. I think we only have five across the country. Um, people who have been formerly incarcerated who work for the house or a senator in their state. But for Washington, it's it's just Tara. Like it's that is phenomenal and also. Like she's a team of one. So I would encourage all folks directly impacted or to get the information out there um, to share their experience and use all of us as an asset. Feel free to reach out to any of us. We're super accessible um, so that we can help get people in the right places to help make the changes that we need based on not just our experience, but um, all of the young people. And we know the recidivism rates, it's outrageous and absolutely disgusting, to tell the truth, um, for juveniles and adults. And as Anthony said, 95% of us are coming home, and we have, and we still have so much more to go. So my new role with the Department of Commerce, oh, I think I'm running over time. So my new role, I just want to say that with the Department of Commerce, I really feel heavy on my heart. Um, we finally have appointed by the governor a full statewide reentry council, and we also have a new executive director for the first time in 13 months. Very exciting. So there's some momentum, and um, we should utilize that. And I would encourage everybody to reach out to them, come to the meetings. They're bi-monthly. If you have other questions, I'll send them out. Emily and I think I'm over time. So is that no, right? that. That's perfect. You're right. You're right on time. Thank you oh. so much. Okay. Um, so once again, thanks so much for our uh, to our panelists for uh, taking their time and being here and sharing their stories and the work that they do. We have a few questions in the chat. Um, here's one that I saw. Are there any organized efforts to help more of the formerly incarcerated run for office in Washington or elsewhere? Um, does anyone feel they could speak to that. Start I, mean, know? I was struggling with it. Like, I hope this is a very safe space because I was <laughs> like, I just told all the business, well, some of it, but I, I don't know if they're, I know individuals like going for city councils and others that are, they're working on creating a coalition of those of us who have been directly impacted. Um, to work on helping elect them. What it really comes down to is to be 100% honest. It's all about who you know and how much money folks are willing to support. So it, the answer, I don't think that there is. If there is, please let me know if I'm wrong. That would be amazing. Um, Anthony, do you? I don't, not, I don't think so, right? Not locally. Uh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know nationally, so. In Delaware, I know there's a group of folks. Um, and in Philly, um, I, I didn't in, I, I didn't include a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, Tiara, you might have an answer better than we do. Um, but I do a lot of work for wrongful conviction cases. I only have one currently that I volunteer for in Philly, hashtag free Tyree Wallace. Um, and I know there's a whole campaign around the new governor in Pennsylvania and the new mayor to work on these things, but nothing official that I'm aware of. But if any of these folks run for office, you can you best believe there's going to be a whole community of people behind them supporting them. So I'm, we're, we're constantly, it's funny, we're always like encouraging each other, but everybody's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag yeah. Tierra, that's you. Oh, yeah, yeah. No pressure. Anthony, <laughs> let's go, Anthony. Both of y'all. <laughs> Okay. All right. Another question we have, both Tierra and Kurt mentioned the barriers to accessing higher education for formerly incarcerated people. Could you say a bit more about what those barriers are and what organizations like the Hus Husky Post Pathways Initiative and the formerly incarcerated college graduates network do to address them? Um, and Tierra, sure. go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if Kurt wanted to start. Um, 
I can then pass it along. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, there are when people are accessing, um, well, first of all, there are in general just inequities to access to higher education that are racial, social, um, any other sort of way that someone can be considered marginalized or historically um, excluded that exists in the um, in higher education as well. And so a lot of people, when you think about the inequities um, that exist in our criminal legal system, those are also racial, socioeconomic based and other um, and other in other ways that people are uh, disproportionately impacted. It really just <clears throat> sort of is exacerbates the inequities that exist in higher education. So people who are impacted by incarceration are even much more le less likely. So when trying to access higher education, there are barriers to re-entry. When you um, get out of prison, there are um, significant barriers um, to even just basic access to basic needs that people need in order to be successful in higher education. So um, access, a lot of people are not um, in a position to be um, economically fit enough to access higher education. Higher education is expensive. You also need to be able to have somewhere to live, to eat, to support yourself. Um, so I, for one, uh, a lot of people leave prison and, and need to find an income stream, right? Hopefully now a legal income stream through employment. Um, it's difficult to work full time and go to school. Some people do that, um, but again, access to higher education is really expensive. So um, when people do um, gain access to higher education, there's also barriers related to, oh shoot, we're coming up short on time, but barriers related to being able to be successful there. There is uh, limited access to funds and um, scholarships and financial aid if your crimes were drug related, um, lots of different things. I'm gonna, I'll pass it to Kurt since we have like one minute. <laughs> yeah, I'll just address the second part of that. So what we've been able to do with F uh, FICGN and with the Husky Post Prison uh, Pathways Program. So those are two separate projects, both born out of Chris, uh, Dr. Christopher, Professor Christopher Beasley's sort of uh, brain. He's, he's, he's been quite the community leader uh, with regard to, um, to University of Washington, Tacoma, but Washington State as, uh, as a whole. And so um, uh, he helped co-found the FICGN and also has been, you know, instrumental in helping us uh, attain leadership and be able to create the Husky Post Prison Pathways program. Uh, that it's not necessarily a program yet, but it is a community of folks that have been working together. But there's a steering committee, there's an advisory board, there has been strategic planning, there has been all these things, and really we're just waiting for funds. Uh, and support from different from the institution, maybe from state um, sources, uh, wherever we can uh, get support. We'll, we're, we're trying to hunt down those uh, funding streams right now. But ultimately, I think what both of these uh, entities have been able to do successfully is galvanize community supporting one another showing uh being able to be models modeling the way for the folks that are getting out so they can see people like tiara or me or anthony or um you know countless other folks uh who have been out here doing this kind of work and say oh wow there there, there is a way for me there is a path forward and so um really um it's just the folks that have been able to create that path uh creating a path so that everyone else can follow behind is what we've been able to achieve down there so far i don't know if there's any i mean we've been able to do some things like we've wrote, raised enough funds to do some like emergency support during covid we were able to help uh some folks a little bit i believe um and um, but but really, it's about being able to let folks come out of the because a lot of people are in hiding. A lot of a lot of folks think that they have you know a scarlet letter on their on their chest, and they don't want to talk about the fact that they've been incarcerated and that they have this history. And so it, it gives them the opportunity to say, "Wow, I can come out. I see they're doing it, and they're they're loud and they're proud and they're out here." And and that's what we've been able to do. So um, is there anything else you can think of, Tierra, that we've uh, as far as um, supporting and breaking down those barriers that you mentioned. I just um, really quickly oh. want to jump in. Sorry. No, thank you so much, Kurt. Yeah. I just wanted to let folks know that um, we, we are at time. Um, it sounds like um, 
Tiara, Kurt, um, and Sarcia maybe to stay on for a couple of minutes if, if folks want to, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists and all of our attendees today. We're so grateful for you to be here. And Anthony, Tiara, Kurt, Starcia, um, just the information you've shared and the stories you've shared have just been so amazing. Um, we will follow up with an email with the information and links mentioned this session. And if there were questions we weren't able to get to, we'll uh, get, try to get those answered for you and, and include that in the follow up as well. So thank you. Have a great afternoon. And I will hand it back over to M. And if, if folks want to, to kind of wrap up, we can do that. But otherwise, have a great afternoon. So I wanted to, to uh, um, ask one final question um, from the chat, which was, are there any national bills in progress or laws or programs working to address the different issues you have each talked about today? Um, so if, if you um, have, if y'all have any thoughts about national or broader, maybe uh, broader programs that you, you've heard about or that you've experienced, um, I think that would be a great way to a final question. And I've collected some of the additional questions um, in the chat uh, just so that the, the uh, y'all are aware. But um, if anyone wants to, to try to answer that question, go ahead. There are lots of national bills and I'm happy to send a follow-up email. I do just briefly, cause we are over time and thank you so much for everyone who attended today, taking your weekend to come and join an amazing group of folks. Um, that something that people should be aware of is for, for universities on the application, if there is the question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? or however long they decide to make that. Um, it's something that lots of folks can be addressing and talking about, and there is a whole coalition that's working on those issues. I think that's something worth saying. And, uh, and I'll send you the bills, and if you're happy, if you're, you're okay with sending that to everyone else, there, there's a lot, just so you know, maybe like 117 that I've been tracking and following across the country to try to implement or used to reinforce some of the amazing work that Tierra, Kurt, Anthony, and other folks have been working on for a long time, civil survival, ACLU, credible messengers, the list goes on of, of pretty amazing folks, so. That wasn't, that wasn't very well answered. I know it wasn't details, but if you guys want to stay on late, I'll get the whole list out of printed in front of me. So, just, uh, Anthony, you didn't talk about the nothing about us without us, which I was like, I felt compelled to say, but I put a bunch of links in the chat for the bills you did talk about. There's there's so many bills yeah. um, and very important work to be done. Obviously, like we have our marching orders right above him. There's lots to do, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the the way to get started is is locally first and some of the national efforts are uh, they're they're strong we always need supporters locally um, at the state city county level to to get things done you know nationally i know voting rights act and they've been working on trying to do some work around that for a very long time um, um, you know a lot of those efforts trickle down to working in the states because it's harder to get the national efforts passed. And also when they do, there's a lot more compromise and it also can hurt efforts locally. Um, so, you know, we try to be careful when we're doing the national work um, to create a minimum standard um, instead of uh, instead in, instead of just this is how it's going to be. So uh, yeah, it's a complicated answer, or it's a complicated question to answer because it's like a yeah, it's a yes and. There are bills, obviously. Sarge said there's uh, a ton of them, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again so much to our panelists and to everyone who joins. 
this has been a fantastic conversation. We're so grateful for your experience and your your willingness to provide um, a little bit of information about all the great work that that you you're do, you're doing right now in this space. Um, and yeah, thank thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Jackie, if uh, is there anything else you would um, anything further? No, I think we're all set. Thank you, everyone, okay. and have a all great right. afternoon. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma.